This is CBC Here and Now. He just came out out of his pocket and it just sprayed it everywhere in everybody's faces. I had heard that there was an attack and I heard something about students being bear sprayed and so that was enough for me to, to come down here. There's like two groups of people like in the school and they don't get along so that's what that was about. Police and ambulance crews surround a St. John's High School. A fight sees a dozen students treated hit with what's believed to be bear spray. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. A fight at a St. John's High School escalated today and dozens of students ended up doused with a spray. Here now is Ryan Cook was on scene at Prince of Wales Collegiate earlier today and he's joining us live at the moment. Ryan, walk us through what happened here. Well, Debbie, just moments ago, we obtained a copy of a video of the incident that's been going around on social media. So let's just take a look here and, and see exactly what happened. Oh, what the? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Seven ambulances and five police cars showed up here on scene within minutes. It was a windy day, so like I said, when the bear spray went off, it went everywhere. Now, police say that 15 to 20 students were treated and one was taken to hospital. But witnesses tell us it was more like 50 to 100 kids that were struck by a cloud of that toxic burning spray. Now, we spoke with a few of those kids earlier today who were there when the bear spray went off. We went out back and we saw like green brown smoke coming in the sky. I walked towards it, got it all in my eyes, and like around my mouth it was stinging. And then I tried to look for my girlfriend and get her out of there as fast as I could. So did you know at the time that it was bear spray? No, we didn't. We were all, well, I was just sat in the car and like, I was just sat down and I just seen a bunch of people crowded around. I didn't, I thought like something was going down. And uh, as everybody was getting close, he just came out, out of his pocket and it just sprayed it everywhere in everybody's faces. and. It was just everywhere. I had to run away because it was just too much. What did it feel like? It stung a lot. It just hurt. You couldn't open your eyes, your mouth, you had needed water in it right away. There was even people like taking off their shirts and everybody passing out water bottles just pouring in their eyes and everything. Everybody's eyes were just red. It was just really terrible. It was a really bad stinging. So do you know what this was all about? What there's, you know, there's like two groups of people like in the school and they don't get along. So that's what that was about. So it just started as a fight and then escalated Pretty into... Well. Yeah. Escalated into weapons and stuff, yeah. Now, police aren't saying exactly what those weapons are, but we spoke with witnesses earlier. Some said that there was a golf club involved. Others said that there was a baseball bat. Police reminded us this is high school. Stories spread fast and the details can vary from person to person. But they did say that they're, they're investigating this pretty seriously. All right, Ryan, well, stories might spread fast, but that video certainly shows a powerful spray of whatever that was. Also, the images you shot today, a lot of police cruisers, a lot of ambulance there at the school. Did this have much of an impact on, on the rest of the city today? Yes, yeah, so we know that the hospital went into a code orange, and what that basically means is that they're prepared for, for mass casualties or multiple victims from incidents happening around the city. Now, we know that minor surgeries were put on hold today at the Health Sciences Centre from around 11 a.m. to just before 12. So while this ended up being a fairly minor incident compared to what a code orange at a city school could be, everybody did take this very seriously. Live tonight, and that's our Ryan Cook live for us tonight. Thanks, Ryan. So back to the 90s, that's what's happening here at Mile One Stadium. Bands like Whitfield, Aqua, and Prozac who are sound checking on the stage now will be playing. I'm live and I'll tell you all about it coming up. The third day of the Muskrat Falls Inquiry kicked off by taking a long look into its past. Also taking a stand was now Core CEO Stan Marshall. Here and now's Jacob Barker was in the room. Jacob, what was said today? 
Well, Debbie, today started by taking a long look backwards. J Jason Churchill, a historian with a particular expertise in hydroelectric development along the Churchill River, took the stand. He took us all the way back to pre-Confederation days through to 20, uh, 2007. He said the inquiry is a valuable tool for future historians that want to take a look back at the project. The papers and the resources and the transcripts from here will do so much to uh, put things into context for them. So it's valuable to capture the story at a moment in time because we don't know where it's going to play out and you have those resources that can be used for multiple things afterwards. So I think in and of itself it, it has an inherent value. And also sharing the theater uh, was a meeting of the CEOs. Former CEO Ed Martin has been on hand to hear these hearings since they began. He listened on to testimony being given by current CEO Stan Marshall. Marshall famously characterized past management of the Muskrat Falls project as a boondoggle. And today he basically just gave an overview of the pro project, giving an explanation about various aspects and where they stand. Like a ma majority of the construction is completed on the North Dam and it should be done by the end of the year. Um, there's an ongoing installation of turbines and gener generators. It was a, a very uh, technical overview of the project. But what was interesting was a statement Marshall made outside the inquiry room uh, afterwards. It was regarding discussions he had with the Premier regarding the plan for the provincial government to engage the PUB in reducing the impact of Muskrat fa Falls on power rates. Any discussions with the Premier's office or with the government generally? He informed me in, before he did it, yes. There were some discussions. But as, as always, the Premier doesn't always listen to my advice. You didn't think it should be done? I say it bites an added burden on us now, uh, but we'll accommodate it. So those were the questions being put to Marshall outside the inquiry room, but inside the inquiry room, not very many questions were put to him today. There will be another chance, though, to, uh, to grill him later in the inquiry. Uh, after tomorrow's tour of the site, Marshall is set to appear in the second phase of the inquiry, which focuses more on the construction period of the project. Uh, reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. Well, as Jacob just told you, NALCOR CEO Stan Marshall was on the witness stand in Labrador today where the Muskrat Falls inquiry is ramping up its search for answers. But Marshall's name was also on the court docket in St. John's, where top contractors with the mega project want a judge to stop Marshall from releasing information about how much they get paid. Rob Antle was at Supreme Court today and has these details. Three top contractors on the Muskrat Falls project have taken their boss to court. They filed documents back in July, and their lawyer was here at Supreme Court today. Pay details for contractors on the mega project used to be off limits. But earlier this year, the province changed the law to make them public. So CBC filed some requests through access information. Nalcor CEO Stan Marshall was going to release those pay details, but some contractors said no. Paul Harrington, Lance Clark, and Tanya Power are senior managers there working on contract. They went to court to stop that from happening, saying it was an invasion of privacy. The case was supposed to proceed today. But earlier this week, the Court of Appeal issued a ruling in a similar matter, rejecting privacy arguments, this one involving teacher salaries, saying the pay details of people on the public payroll are public information, a case that could set a precedent, could be appealed even further. So because of all that, the Muskrat Falls case is in a holding pattern and will be due back in court later this year. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. Still with Nalcor, earlier this summer, the company said it reached a significant milestone. Nalcor had successfully sent power from Churchill Falls to the Avalon Peninsula through its Labrador Island link. But an independent consultant is now questioning whether that link can be counted on this winter. Here now's Mark Quinn has that story. This is what independent consultants are warning could happen again. Rolling blackouts that hit Newfoundland hard in January 2014, forcing some people to scramble to help seniors out of their homes. In a report to the PUB, the Liberty Consulting Group warns that for at least part of this winter, the island's interconnected system could be at the mercy of the weather. 
The consultants say this $3.4 billion link between Labrador and the Avalon Peninsula may not be able to provide power to the island reliably. And that, paired with the troubled Holyrood Thermal Generating Station, increases the risk of supply-related outages. Officials at Nalcor tell CBC that they're working hard to get the new link up and running. They say this link may not be operating at full capacity in the coming months, but they are putting plans in place to prevent outages this coming winter. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, we have lots of scattered showers for the island, a chance of flurries for Labrador West tomorrow, and we're keeping an eye on a wet and windy system that's heading our way Friday night into Saturday. All the details coming up. Well, today is the 11th school day that students in Red Bay, Labrador are going to miss because of an ongoing protest by parents. However, the English School District isn't saying whether it's going to force the parents to send their kids to class. The parents are upset that half a teaching position was cut from Basque Memorial School. They're blocking staff from entering the school and they're keeping their kids at home. The school board says it's sending a senior official to the community to try to end the dispute. There are eight students across five grades at that school with a staff of one teacher who also acts as principal. There's also a secretary and a janitor. Last year, the school had one and a half teaching positions. Talks between Memorial University and its Faculty Association are set to resume tomorrow. Contract negotiations began eight months ago, but MUNFA requested the help of a conciliator this summer. The two sides met late last week with no resolution and will be in talks again tomorrow and Friday. There are about 850 faculty, librarians, counselors, and co-op and field education coordinators at the St. John's campus, Grenfell campus in Cornerbrook, and the Marine Institute. Last year, more than 18,000 students registered at the three campuses. If conciliation talks reach an impasse, the government-appointed conciliator has the option of submitting a report to government. This would trigger a 15-day countdown for both parties to be in a position to take a strike vote or initiate a lockout. The last time there was a strike was in 2000, and it lasted two weeks. Saturday night, I feel the air is getting hot Like me, baby Well, if you don't recognize the faces, you most likely recognize the music. Wigfield, Prozac, and Aqua are in town tonight as part of the Cross Country Rewind Tour. It's a celebration of the past as concert goers at Mile One Center will be turning back the clock to head way back to the 1990s. Now, nobody loves a 90s party more than here and now is Jeremy Eaton, who does kind of live in a Barbie world. He's down at Mile One Center tonight for us. So, uh, Jeremy, how's the party? Well, Anthony, I, I, I sort of jokingly tell people, jokingly now, that I peaked in the year 1998. And uh, that song that you're hearing in the background, background, Barbie Girl, that song actually came out in 1997. So if you can just look here behind us, uh, the band Prozac, they're a Canadian band. Uh, they're getting ready to, they're doing their sound check now to get ready for the, uh, the show tonight. And uh, earlier we met with the band Aqua. So they were a popular uh, Danish uh, rock group who sang the Barbie Girl song. So we're going to hear from them later on the show. And then opening the show is also another Dane, which is Whitfield, who had that song Saturday night to begin with. Now, as you can see, there's nobody here yet because the doors haven't opened, but they are going to open shortly. But I tweeted out trying to find people if they were going in an interest in, in this show. And there is a lot of interest in talking to staff here. 5,000 people are expected to descend on mile one on a Wednesday night, which is pretty good. And a lot of them are hoping to relive some of the memories of what is arguably, in my opinion, the greatest decade of all time, the 1990s. So the show is set to get underway. I think the doors open around 6.30. There's going to be a much video dance on the screen behind me. For those who went to school in the 1990s, you might remember that. And then the bands are going to get underway, and uh, it should be a pretty good time down here tonight. So they're just getting some sound check now, so it's getting a little bit loud. So I'm going to throw it back to you in the studio, but later on the show, we're going to hear from two of the members of Aqua about what this Canadian tour has been like. Reporting live for here now, I'm Jeremy Eaton down at my Mile One Center.
My uh, family is from Newfoundland, Topsail Beach and the Village Mall. I wrote that into the film as well, and Mount Pearl Square uh, worked really well for us. She lives in Toronto and works in L.A. This week, she's shooting her first full-length film right here at home. We go to the set of Black Conflux. That's coming up. Campaigning in Windsor Lake is just about over. Time for the voters to pick a new MHA. CBCNL brings you the by-election results as they come in. Who wins? Who loses? Stick with us tomorrow on Facebook Live and on YouTube shortly after the polls close at 8 o'clock Island Time. Welcome back once again. Well, it's a movie called Black Conflux, and it's set in the 1980s. It's being shot right here in this province in CBS and surrounding areas. Yeah, the director's from Toronto and makes a living shooting commercials in Los Angeles, but she does have a connection to this place. As Here Now's Todd O'Brien reports, it's her first feature film, and she explains why she chose Newfoundland as the place to shoot it. Action. Today's scene, the cinema. Four friends spending the day bonding. They've smoked some pot and done a little shoplifting when the store clerk and a security guard find them and give chase. Hey! <laughs> hey! Cut. Cut. 
Nicole Dorsey is the writer and director. She's made TV commercials and short films. But this is her first feature length, a psychological drama. This film is a story of two lives that run parallel the whole film until they're brought together at the end. So we have Jackie, who's a 15-year-old girl, kind of dealing with the trials of adolescence and her emerging womanhood. And then we have Dennis, um, who is sort of having uh, issues with his psyche. It's a small budget film, but she's landed some pretty impressive talent, including Ella Ballantyne. She just played Anne in the three-part Anne of Green Gables movie series in Black Conflux. I play Jackie. She's kind of the one in the friend group that's really growing up in this film. She's really finding herself and who she wants to be. Um, and her friends are more grown up than she is in the sense of high school being grown up. Here we go, locked up, and Director Nicole Dorsey says even though she's half mainlander, she feels part of this community. So my uh, family is from Newfoundland, and my aunt, when I was writing the story, we talked a lot about her experience growing up as a teenager in Newfoundland. So um, Topsail Beach and the Village Mall and all these different places were very much part of her teenage years. So I wrote that into the film as well. And Mount Pearl Square uh, worked really well for us. Filming continues for the next few weeks. This gang, some from Toronto, are soaking Newfoundland up. I yeah, love it. it's so pretty. It's We're from like the city, so like coming out here and being able to see the ocean is it's really cool. And like it's more hilly too. Like oh, the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. terrain's like totally different and it's so much more colorful, I find. But yeah, it's really cool. Once finished, the film will tour the festival circuit and hopefully end up in a theater near you. Todd O'Brien, CBC News, Mount Pearl. I'll have to look for that one yeah, for sure right yeah. on the road. Uh, Carolyn, you have a picture to yes, start for this. But this. I wanted to start first with this uh, this shot here of a double rainbow from Do Gander. That. Yeah, in this video, uh, Garrett Berry, our reporter out there, uh, sent this in to us. Uh, yeah, just a little. Oh, it always makes me smile. It, yeah, me too. You don't seem too often. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Two double or two the pots rainbows, of, yes. two pots of gold. I'm not saying they don't pay us well, but those pots of gold will be right <laughs> underneath the CBC vehicle there if uh, Garrett wants to go out there and get one. That's kind of cool. Very nice. And mm -hmm. yeah, oh. this is a photo. I, I just, I love sunflowers. And uh, they're so massive, aren't they? And <laughs> hey, uh, you can't go wrong with a dog. This is a little Zoe uh, standing by the sunflowers in Port de Grave. So Ralph Daw uh, sent this in and saying despite the cold temperatures, uh, the sunflowers are doing quite well. They're really tall. Wow. I like the expression on the dog's face. <laughs> it doesn't look too well, happy. Yeah. What's, what's the big deal with these flowers? <laughs> Honey, we shrank the dog. <laughs> So fortunately, uh, Port de Grave is not in the area that is under a frost advisory. Ah. We have another one of those in effect for tonight, and that's where I'm going to start the weather okay. forecast. Just have a look at this. Mostly uh, the west coast up through the northern peninsula, Buckins, Grand Falls, Win Windsor, all under another frost advisory tonight. So if you have plants outdoors, bring them in. Bring them in if you can or cover them up. Do what you can to protect them. So tonight we have uh, lots of cloud cover over the island and lots of scattered showers as well. Mostly clear for Labrador overnight tonight and clear clearing skies as well for the west coast of the island. So here's a look at our overnight lows around the freezing mark. We have a chance of showers for central areas there. Could see a few little flurries mixed in with that. Five degrees as the overnight low for St. John's and for Labrador. Mostly clear skies. Uh, Name looking at uh, zero as the low tonight. So tomorrow, these uh, showers continue to affect uh, the central areas and the east coast. For Labrador, could see some flurries moving in in the afternoon. And the west coast, you can see, is uh, looking at a nice 
great day tomorrow. So if you are heading outdoors tomorrow, this is kind of the setup. All of these little pops of showers coming down from the north. So this is what it's going to be like if you're on the Avalon Peninsula and in central uh, tomorrow. 11 degrees as the high in St. John's. A little bit warmer along the southern part of the Avalon as we head towards central. 9 degrees in the Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor area with those chance of showers throughout the day. Nice uh, sunshine on the west coast tomorrow. 11 degrees for Corner Brook, Humber Valley. Could see a shower or two and 9 degrees as the high there. Clear and sunny in Portishwa, 10 degrees. And uh, Cartwright looking at 11 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. And for the rest of Labrador, chance of those showers and flurries for Lab West. Southwesterly winds there gusting to 49 degrees as the high and then clearing as we head towards the coast. Not a bad day for Happy Valley Goose Bay, 14 degrees and a mix of sun and cloud. Now we do have uh, a system heading our way uh, over the weekend, Friday night into Saturday. It's going to bring lots of wind, rain, but it's also going to bump up the temperatures just a bit. I'll have all those details a bit later. Diagnosed uh, first time was my wife. And she said, Stephen, your eyes are some yellow. And uh, I said, bloodshot. I said, I'm, I'm tired. I got a show. Comedian Steve Coombs outlines his experience with cancer in a new show with a name that you might just recognize. That's next on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here Now. A performer who's launching a new show this month at the LSPU Hall in St. John's combines two big C words for his act. They might surprise you, comedy and cancer. Steve Coombs has been performing comedy now for a decade, and then he got a, a cancer diagnosis. His show is called, get this, Here and Now. And tonight, he shares his story and some of the insight he has in his upcoming show. I'm Steve Coombs, and I'm a stand-up comedian. But I'm sitting right now. I've always loved stand-up comedy. I've always, and I've always been a jokester in school, uh, you know, a bit of a class clown. Uh, it's kind of cliche, but that's what I was like. I uh, joke around with my friends, doing impressions, impersonations. I got a bit of a bad memory, so she recommended we get uh, married on like a momentous occasion, like a, a specific date, so God love her, she picked November 11th. <laughs> Lest I forget. <laughs> but it's awesome, because every year you get your anniversary off, and uh, two minutes of silence. When I was first diagnosed, um, first sign was my wife, and she said, Stephen, your eyes are some yellow. And uh, I said, bloodshot? I said, I'm, I'm tired. I got a show out around the bay tonight. And she said, no, she said, your eyes are yellow. And the next day, Father's Day, I uh, ended up passing blood. And we went to St. Clair's Emerge, and we are there pretty much all Father's Day. And eventually, uh, the ER doctor, chief ER doctor came in, and he just said, you got a mass on your pancreas creating a blockage. And, you know, uh, it's funny, a uh, word that's so heavy, like just been dropped on you, like it was weightless. And of course, my sister, uh, she was diagnosed 17 years to the day that I was diagnosed with stomach cancer, and she passed away when she was 29. And uh, she had a young family. She had a husband and a 14 month old son. So, of course, when I heard the news, um, it just just kind of hits you like a ton of bricks initially. You know, you think, how am I going to tell my parents? they got to put another child in the ground. Uh, what do I tell my daughters? How do I tell them, you know, daddy's going to die? Uh, I'm still here. But uh, those are the type of things that goes go through your head. I looked at my wife and I said, you know, we promised the girls we're going to take them to Disney World. And I'm taking them to Disney World. We got to do it, and the doctors seemed to have a, a plan in place for me. They seemed to know what they wanted to do. They were going to have surgery and take it out. I was writing jokes while I was in the ER bed because you know that that's what I do all throughout my life. Whether someone dies or something bad happens, I always use humor to to deal with it. I recently lost a lot of weight. Thank you, cancer. The kids were four and eight when I was diagnosed, and they're seven and 11 now. And Sarah decided she was gonna write a s story about me in school, because the kids got to pick who to write about, um, write about their hero. And she came home, she said, Daddy, she said, uh, we gotta do a hero project for school. And I said, oh, that's great. And she said, guess who I picked? I said, I don't know. She said, you. I said, wow. And, and as a dad, it kind of, blows you away and then your next thought is like why so I asked her and she said well it was either you or Isaac Newton <laughs> and I was like well take that Sir Isaac one thing that we did when I first got diagnosed and one of those unanswered questions of how to tell your kids I didn't tell my kids uh, because they were so young and it seemed like surgery was at least for now gonna take care of things I didn't think about the fact that she'd have to research me online she started reciting my bio one night Steve Coombs, funny bald man. And then I said, where did you get that to? She said, Google. I said, oh. And she said, yeah, I was looking you up for my research project. And instantly I was like, oh, I have to make my YouTube page 18 plus. And I didn't know, she knew for about two weeks and she cornered me one night when we were going to bed and she started doing her survey and asking me questions. And one of the questions was, um, you know, what obstacle did you have to overcome to become a hero? I said, yeah, I guess that was the time I had that stomach infection. She goes, yeah, what was the name of that stomach infection? I said, uh, I said, that's a cool question, Sarah. I said, well, it was just an infection in my stomach. And she goes, it must have a name, just like certain cancers have names. And that's when I knew that she knew, and we had the conversation. Why didn't you tell me? Well, and her little sister had walked in the room at one point, I said, Look at her, she's seven years old. 
I said, that was you three years ago, and I didn't want to take that from you. It was a deep conversation to have with her. In the end, learning to appreciate uh, every single moment that you do have and to be in the moment. It becomes less about the big mountain that you wanted to climb or set out to climb, to all the little moments in your life. Smelling your daughter's hair when she's cuddled up going to bed. Uh, getting to read to them every night when they're going to sleep. Uh, having them jump on the bed when they get up in the morning to uh, teach them how to ride a bike. That was one of the first, one of the first things I thought about when I was diagnosed was, wow, Anna doesn't know how to ride a bike, and she still does. <laughs> But, you know, I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm helping her figure it out. <laughs> we'll get there. Some wonderful words of wisdom from comedian Steve Coombs. If you want to see that item again or share it with your friends, you can find it on our website. That's at cbc.ca slash nl. Beautiful picture of uh, a woman and three young teenage children some houses in the background, a little fishing net off to the side of the image, a few scattered other people way off in the background. Finding old photos. A man folklorist takes to Facebook to track down a mystery family. Welcome back. It's the kind of mystery a Mun folklorist hopes for. Finding an old roll of film full of memories belonging to a cast of unknown characters. Well, that's just what happened to Philip Hiscock. Here he is telling the story in his own words. I found it in a junk shop downtown, a junk shop back in 1991 is when I bought it. I bought it because when I picked it up, it had a real heft, and I knew this was a, and just looking at it, I knew it was a, a high quality camera from an earlier period. I also knew from the feel that there was film in it. I didn't have to open it up. I could test the tension on the, the winder. Out of it, there were three pictures, beautiful pictures. Um, one in particular is just startling in its sharpness and its it's, it's in its art. It's a beautiful picture of uh, a woman and three young teenage children, uh, you know, perhaps 13 to 15 or something, 
on a wharf with a slipway alongside of them, some houses in the background, a little fishing net off to the side of the image, a few scattered other people way off in the background, and just beautifully sharp, beautifully exposed. And then two other ones, one where one of those children is operating a, a big bow and arrow, and uh, then a third where a man, presumably the guy who took the pictures, perhaps the father of all these children, um, was also operating that, that bow and arrow. The night before last, I scanned these, and, uh, uh, and I thought, well, I should put these on Facebook just to see. And that's what started the, uh, the spread of shares that led to us finding out who it was. Within an hour, someone said, that's Baleen. Kelly Russell, who's a friend of mine, Kelly said, uh, the musician, he said, oh, yeah, that's definitely Baleen. I used to own that house up there in the corner. <laughs> and so, you know, it was pretty, we, we found out that pretty quickly it was Baleen. And then as... I think when I looked yesterday at lunchtime, there were 350 people had shared this. Through that, I found out, in fact, who is in this. It was a man, um, Ray Simmons was his name. He was, he was a little like me. He was apparently a photo nut. And uh, I've only had a couple of conversa or email conversations with his family. But he would uh, use old cameras, and he'd take pictures wherever he could, and he'd get the family out. And, and they had a, a cabin on the Balling Line, they, so they'd go down to Balling Proper, from time to time, and this picture was taken down in Balling proper, and then the ones with the archery were taken up at the cabin. One of the people who, who commented on the picture was one of the daughters of the man who took the picture. She's actually not in the picture, okay. but her sisters and her brother are, and one of her cousins, and she knew, of course, all of them and, and uh, uh, tagged them all in the picture. So I, I, I hope that I'll be able to get a good print of these pictures to them. And... Uh, I joked with her, maybe we'll follow it through. I'd like to get them all down on Pauline Wharf one day and take that same picture with this camera 45 years later or whatever it is. That would be great. Yeah, yeah it's quite the big camera. <laughs> this is a big size of that, right? It's amazing. They think about Debbie in the old days, pre-internet, how long it would take to actually research who's in this picture and today. Bang, like that. Online and people find lo the location, who these people might be. It's fantastic. <laughs> amazing. All right, in other news, the search continues this evening for two fishermen off the coast of western Prince Edward Island. They've been missing since Tuesday afternoon when their boat capsized. A third crew member managed to swim to safety and raise the alarm. The CBC's Steve Bruce has the latest. Well, since early this morning, a lot of people have been involved in this search, combing the shoreline and these waters off North Cape. This whole search effort started last evening. That's when, according to staff at this North Cape restaurant, a man showed up here soaked, tired, and looking for help. And he was drenched and shaking. He was really shaking, and he was really not himself. I thought he was in shock. And he said to me, he said, the boat went down. The boat went down. And uh, he said, help me. He said the lobster boat he was on had capsized a couple miles out. The boat's captain and another crew member were still out there somewhere. Throughout the evening and overnight, strong winds, waves and darkness hampered the search. Finally this morning, as the wind died down and the sun came up, more searchers did set out. The Coast Guard, PEI ground search and rescue, local fishermen and firefighters all racing the clock to try and locate the two men. Doing whatever they could do. I mean, they're all along the shoreline here. and. I mean, uh, you know, the water's a rough place and it's a hard place to make a living and uh, it's just, there's only so much you can do. You, know, you just keep looking and keep hoping is all you can do. Just down the road in Tignish, where the fishermen had been heading when their boat capsized, many community members have turned to prayers. Multiple vigils have been held for the missing fishermen, all of them packed. Everybody's sticking together and praying together, so there's nothing else you can do. It's terrible. Yeah, and it can be anybody because all, all the community around here is all fishermen, eh? So it can be anybody. When one hurts, everybody hurts. It's now a full day into the search, though, and still no fishermen. The search is expected to continue this evening. Steve Bruce, CBC News, North Cape. So we're standing here technically sort of side stage, not really backstage, but Wakefield, Prozac, and a band called Aqua are going to be playing here soon. I chatted with the band Aqua. We're going to hear some of that interview coming up.
get a good look at our long range forecast. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it warms up a bit. Yeah, it is going to warm up a little bit. Friday is looking decent and then we have a system moving through that's going to bring lots of wind and rain, but it's also going to change the wind direction. So to a southwesterly, so oh, temperatures good. should be boosting up a little bit. It's going to be messy though. Right. <laughs> Let's have a look at uh, some current temperatures for the province. Seven degrees in St. John's right now. Seven as well in Labrador City and Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now we do have this frost warning in effect for the West Coast, Northern Peninsula, in through the uh, interior, Grand Falls, Windsor, Buckins, all uh, have a frost advisory in place for overnight tonight. So this evening we do have uh, this trend of these showers just coming down from the north for the eastern portion of the island. Uh, and that's going to continue tomorrow. We're looking at 11 degrees in St. John's as the high tomorrow. And uh, similarly with uh, Grand Falls, Windsor, and Gander, nine degrees with a chance of showers throughout the day. Could even see a little flurry action in the morning for the West Coast, though, looking like a really nice day. Port of Basque, 13 degrees with lots of sunshine there. St. Anthony, a mix of sun and cloud and eight degrees as the high. For Labrador, the West could see a mix of snow and rain in the morning, uh, heading up to a high of nine degrees. Happy Valley Goose Bay, not looking too bad. 14 degrees as the high with a mix of sun and cloud there. So as we get into Friday, it's going to be pretty quiet actually on Friday. Uh, lots of of, uh, sunshine for the island, bit of cloud cover there for Labrador, and this is the system that I was talking about earlier that's going to come up through over the weekend uh, starting in Labrador. But for Friday afternoon, we're looking at 15 degrees uh, for central and mix of sun and cloud. Sun and cloud for the entire island, 11 in the east and 14 in the west. Mainly cloudy day coming for uh, eastern Labrador and a chance of some afternoon showers for the west as that system starts to make its way uh, towards Labrador. So this is how that's going to play out uh, at the moment. Uh, heavy rain here in the yellow, also some snow. So the place that could be affected most by this is the Nain, northern uh, part of Labrador with the snowfall. We'll know more about totals tomorrow. Uh, the island, the west coast should see the heaviest of the rainfall. Here we are Saturday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It hasn't quite hit the Avalon Peninsula yet. So uh, yeah, we'll see how that all plays out. But it does bump the temperatures up. This is what we're looking at uh, for the island. Temperatures between 16 and 17 degrees. It's going to be quite windy. It's going to be mostly a wind uh, system uh, that's coming. So that's going to be the, the big uh, part of this, <laughs> more so than the rain. Uh, for Labrador, looking at a chance of showers uh, on Saturday as that system starts to work its way out 13 degrees as the high in eastern Labrador. So this is the five day picture, a bit of a messy Saturday, Saturday night, especially for the east, then clearing on Sunday and Monday with a mix of sun and cloud and temperatures almost in the mid teens. Not too bad for central, a very similar story, 17 degrees on Saturday and temperatures dropping a bit as you get into the work week for western Newfoundland. Chance of some showers moving in there on Monday and for Eastern Labrador Sunday could see some showers, could be some flurries, 12 degrees as the high there and a mix of sun and cloud uh, for Monday. For the West, looking at a chance of some flurries on Sunday and behind that system and uh, another chance of showers there on Monday and temperatures really not, not seeing any, any double digits anywhere on this one. So uh, that's the forecast. Back to you, Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. The Rewind Tour is at Mile One Center tonight with three of the 1990s biggest acts taking the stage. Our Jeremy Eden is also there. Fitting, Jeremy, because you think the 90s was the best decade, I understand. <laughs> Uh, I do believe the term I used, Debbie, was greatest decade of oh. all times, uh, <laughs> but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, I'm not on the stage. I tried my best to get on the stage, but I couldn't, but I'm sort of side stage. Doors just open. People are starting to uh, sort of make their ways in, and uh, on the stage behind us, people are going to hear Aqua, the Canadian band Prozac, the singer Whitfield plays some of the hits that uh, radio stations couldn't get enough of in the mid to late 1990s. And earlier tonight, we got the chance to see Aqua Soundcheck, and then we got to speak to two of the members, Renee and Soren. And here is a little bit of their interview about this cross Canadian tour that they're doing. A Bobby girl in the Bobby world, laughing plastic. It's fantastic. 
So what are you guys doing in St. John's? Well, St. John's, this is our first time in, in St. John's. We have a concert tonight. Uh, practically it's sold out, and uh, we are very, very happy about that. Come on, Barbie, let's go party. What's the tour been like for you, Soren? Absolutely amazing. It's been very overwhelming. Uh, you know, we haven't been here for 18 years. It's, it's like the same as it was 18 years ago. That's, that's, that's quite crazy. Mm. <laughs> and the surprising thing is that, that, that the people are still young. Way back they were young when they attended our concerts. <laughs> now they're, now they're <laughs> even younger. <laughs> it's kind of like it's kind of jumped with the generation that the parents are apparently played music for their kids. And now when you see kids coming here, it's, uh, it's like they're from 14 and up. And it's uh, very overwhelming. And, yeah. and actually, basically, the welcomes here in, in Canada has been, has been yeah. way over what, what we would have uh, expected. It's a pleasure doing what we're doing. You know, the thing about traveling and being together as a band and, and, and doing this, this can't be much better. And, and I mean, also because Canada is, is very, uh, somehow I always thought that Canadian people and Danish people are very well connected. There's something about the humor and the irony and, and the way of living and chilling and stuff like that. You can touch. Jordan, I know you haven't been in St. John's very long. When did you arrive, and what has your experience been like in the city? <laughs> <laughs> we flew in no, this morning. Can I, can I tell you? <laughs> I can, honestly, honestly, we arrived last night, and we were quite, we were a little bit tired when we came, and we came to this shit hotel, and everybody was like, oh my god. I was living in the basement, and we, there was no, anyway, we found a better hotel, and uh, we had a great night last night. Yes, Very there fun. was a little bit of a miscommunication <laughs> about where to live. I looked at the room and I went, can I have the chauffeur come up and pick me? <laughs> but we had a good time. We went to uh, some of the local uh, 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 places here and, uh, and we mingled a little bit with the local people. <laughs> we, and, uh, we invited most of the <laughs> staff the at the we restaurant saw. we were uh, at yesterday. Was, yeah. They're going to be here. <laughs> So as you can see, uh, the band Aqua, they're here, for, uh, they're here for a good time, not a long time, to steal a line from another Canadian band. So it's starting to get loud in here. There's a much video dance party that's probably going to get underway, and a lot of people are pretty excited about what's going to happen here tonight. And the show starts off at 7.30, and sadly, I might not be here. But anyways, for all the people who are here, they're looking forward to having a good time. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at Mile One Centre in St. John's. He's having a good time there. In other news, it's a first for Canada. The Museum of Nature has created a national cryobank. That's a deep freeze facility that will preserve thousands of tissue and DNA samples from different species across the country and from right around the world. Sandra Abma has that story. Welcome to the latest in biodiversity research. They may look like giant instapots, but these state-of-the-art storage containers hold personal histories of thousands of species. There's lots of grizzly bears in here, there's lots of caribou in here, uh, different species of fish. Tiny vials of DNA, tissue and muscle samples stored in liquid oxygen, kept at a cool minus 170 degrees Celsius in Canada's first national cryobank. The new facility has a price tag of $2 million and it's light years away from the old ways of collecting physical specimens of plant and animal life. This new technology preserves their molecular blueprint. So what we'll have here collected is a large and diverse collection of tissues for DNA research so that we can better understand species diversity on planet Earth and we can better understand the health of different populations that might be threatened. The cryobank will loan those samples to scientists looking to unlock the secrets of the natural world. A whole new frontier has opened up. And shades of Jurassic Park. There's plenty of debate in the scientific community about what scientists in the future may be able to do with DNA of species both living and extinct. They could use, in the example of a mastodon or a mammoth, they could take DNA from a living elephant and substitute that and try to recreate the DNA of something I guess you'd call a mastophant or something along those lines. But that's for another time. And you can come and see for yourself on Saturday, October 13th, when there's an open house to this brand new facility. 
Sandra Abma, CBC News, Gatineau. This is today's viewer photo of the day. Isn't it just gorgeous? What a sunset. The reflection off the water. Nothing here really to suggest where in the province it might be. It's on the no. island. <laughs> it's beautiful. Very nice. I'll have uh, the answer after the break. Welcome back once again. A community in Burnaby, BC is doing something different to get drivers to slow down in school zones. It's known as Pavement Patty, an optical illusion painted on the road. Very realistic. When it's drivers, incredible. Yeah, I know. When drivers approach a local elementary school, it looks as if a little girl is chasing her ball right into the street. It's part of a back to school safety campaign reminding drivers that even at low speeds, Kids can be seriously injured if they end up getting hit by a car. It's worth trying something. Clear. Yeah. I wonder if city planners in this province are watching tonight. I <laughs> uh, hope so, because a few spots around here have seen people driving a little quickly. Yes. Very interesting. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would get your attention as you're heading up there. Very well done. Very cool. Mm. Something yeah. else that got our attention was that viewer picture. Yes, isn't this lovely? Uh, is that real? <laughs> it, it is. Apparently this, uh, the clouds were really thick and then it just kind of opened up and this was what uh, came out from underneath. This right. beautiful color, looks like it's on fire. Uh, this shot was taken in Lumsden. Oh, beautiful oh. area. Yes. Beautiful. Just a beauty. So the photographer, who is yes. Tracy, Tracy. Just, Stag. just happened to be Johnny on the spot or Tracy <laughs> on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sending that in. And if you have a photo uh, that you'd like to see on the news, please email it to us at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Well, that's our program for tonight. Big by-election tomorrow. That's right. Polls, polls open at 8, close at 8. Whoever you like, make sure to vote tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Good night.